These days, it seems French actress Juliette Binoche is simply everywhere in the nation's capital, Paris. She's in a retrospective at the Cinémathèque. She's dancing on stage at the Théâtre de la Vie every night. And she's currently the featured artist at the Galerie Art Curial. Everything I do is very instinctive, whatever form of expression I'm working with. It's important to reinvent yourself and see how far you can go to avoid stagnating. We actors have a tendency to sit back and wait to be offered roles, and I think we should stop sitting around and waiting. Olivier Poivre d'Avor, director of the Culture France Arts Agency, has always encouraged Binoche to spread her wings. She's a great actress, but she's not afraid to risk showing what she can do as an inexperienced dancer and an unknown artist. I like this about her, a desire for new experiences, which in her case is really very heartfelt. The fact we spent two years working on this project showed me how serious she is about her work. The Jubilations retrospective features 68 self-portraits of the actress in her various film roles as well as her sketches of directors that she's worked with and poems she's written for them. I wanted to present the directors in some way because normally this is what they do with you. They're the ones with the script who call you up and say they had you in mind for a role and do you want it. In a way, my poems are my answer, in the form of letters, because I felt like using words and writing something down. As for my paintings, I wanted to capture the directors on canvas in the same way they capture me on camera. Juliette Binoche is best known as an actress, and few people know that in fact her first love has always been painting. I started painting as a child. I've always loved drawing and painting. I haven't always had much time for it because I was so busy acting. And I also had my children. But painting means a lot to me. It's part of me and part of my life. Dancing, however, never was. But she learned it in six months with the help of her co-star, British choreographer and dancer Akram Khan. Obviously, some people are very critical, people who think I'm too big for my boots. But why should they decide what I can and can't do? Why shouldn't I do whatever I want? I think it's important to confound their expectations. In France, audiences have been happily surprised by the latest strings added to the Oscar-winning actress's bow. Some drawings can be rather intimidating, but I think she felt it was important to express her feelings this way. Feelings are like dreams. Sometimes they're beautiful and sometimes they're not. And Juliette Binoche wanted to use these paintings to share her experiences with us. A few portraits can be bought for 5,000 euros, while fans can also buy a book containing all of Binoche's paintings and poems. She and Akram Khan will be touring the world with In Eye. So it looks as though it will be a while before Juliette Binoche returns to the big screen. This German children's book made history. Meet Struvelpeter, an unkempt young man who won't cut his hair or his fingernails. And maybe that's why he's become an immortal literary character.
Das Besondere am Struvelpeter ist, dass es die erste Bilderbücher ist, dass es die erste children's picture book in European history. Kinderliteratur darstellt. By picture book, I mean a story that's told in text and pictures simultaneously. Gleichzeitig in Bild und Wort erzählt wird. That had never been done before. And Struvelpeter, the book's opening story, is only one of its ten short tales of disobedient children who are now known around the world. Take Suppenkasper, a little boy who refuses to eat his soup, all the way to the bitter end. He remains totally stubborn, unbroken. And I think that stance of unbroken resistance fascinates children. Incidentally, one has to add that none of the children in Struvelpeta accept any advice or learn a lesson or have a change of heart. They all just go under. The city of Frankfurt is celebrating Struvelpeta with commemorative plaques on public benches. Here near the banks of the Main River is where Struvelpeta's creator Heinrich Hoffmann lived. His 200th birthday is being celebrated. Hoffmann was a doctor and father of three. His second son, Karl, had just turned three, and his dad was searching for a Christmas present. When he couldn't find anything he liked, he sat down with his sketchbook and got to work. Suddenly, the doctor was a children's book author. Struvelpeter specialist Hans Heino Evers believes Hoffmann's experience as a physician decisively influenced the book. We know that he had a special method of quieting children down. He had a notebook in which he drew stick figures and made up amazing stories to go along with them. And it's interesting to see that he keenly observed what effects they had on the kids. This year, Struvelpeter and his success can be seen all over Frankfurt with numerous events and exhibitions. Like this one in the newly refurbished Struvelpeter Museum. It's dedicated to Germany's most successful children's book ever. The legions of young fans have spread far beyond Germany. Struvelpeter has been translated into 40 languages, from Japanese to Portuguese and Greek. It has sold around 30 million copies worldwide. In 1954, a movie was made from the stories in Struvelpeter. And even today, the fascination with the sometimes morbid and brutal stories remains unbroken. I think it's like when we adults read a crime novel. Some pretty gruesome things go on in our imaginations, too. And I think it's similar with kids reading Struvelpeter. But the show also displays unknown sides of Hoffmann. Despite the fame he gained as an author, he remained a physician and became head of psychiatry in Frankfurt, commissioning a new hospital for the purpose. It was one of the biggest and most modern facilities of its time. Hoffmann displayed a keen eye for psychology in the stories, especially in Zappelfilip, today a name given to any child in Germany who can't sit still. I believe he had a remarkable gift for observing the way children are, and I think his gift would be called genius today. Heinrich Hoffmann's Struvelpeter, a book that children, even today, can learn from. Twenty-six thousand singers from Estonia and forty other countries congregated in Tallinn to be part of the 25th Estonian Song and Dance Festival. The 2009 installment of this regular event had been three years in the making. The most important thing is um, to feel the next, uh, the other singers, the, the, to feel uh, when we begin the song singing all together 
making pianos and fortes and diminuendos all together and this is a very good feeling. Many of the performances by the 860 choirs are of traditional Estonian folk songs, some of them centuries old. This unique celebration of choral music is held every five years and first took place 140 years ago. Estonia is known as a choir country, uh, land of choirs. It is, it's our, it's, it's what we do, you know, it's, it's a chorus uh, mentality in a way. I especially love the, the, there are chor choruses, young female choruses here that are just out of this world because it's like water. It is so clean, pure, in tune. The festival also includes dance events. In total, they feature over 10,000 performers, together illustrating the regional diversity of Estonia. Uh, these clothes come from South Estonia, uh, Setuma is it, it's called, and uh, this is very traditional, and a uh, woman can uh, have this on her when she gets married. And also, this marks that the boy is also married when it's on the right side, when it's on the left side. Then I'm single. Estonia calls itself a nation of singers. That has political as well as cultural roots. Mass singing at public gatherings in the 1980s served as a unifying force when challenging the Soviet occupiers. Estonia may have gained independence in 1991, but the idea of national unity and camaraderie still thrives today. That's again reflected in this year's motto, to breathe as one. To have some real joy and enjoyment together, that's what the breathe together means for me, so that we can rise uh, a bit higher uh, of this everyday political struggles, likes and dislikes, forget them, uh, just to be a little bit better people, maybe than usual. But it's not an all-Estonian affair. Also on offer this year was a rousing performance of the Pilgrim's Chorus from Wagner's Tannhäuser. Renowned Estonian conductor Pavel Järvi led proceedings and was eager to use music as a way of boosting ties between Germany and his native Estonia a festival of song, and a celebration of European harmony through its diversity. The star of the evening is still hidden. The 300 guests know it must be a Leica, but what sort? Fans whisper among themselves, wondering what it can do. Leica dealer Lars Netopil doesn't want to miss the moment of unveiling. What awaits the international Leica fan community in the up-and-coming Photokina? What's happening about single-lens reflex cameras? So far we've had manually focused systems, but is automatic focus coming? What will it look like? We are all in suspense. Great expectations. The legend lives on. But what lies behind the Leica phenomenon? Wetzlar is the birthplace of the Leica camera, and it's where Lars Natopil has his camera shop. The 40-year-old used to be an attorney, but he's so crazy about Leica cameras, he changed professions. When I was in school, I photographed with a Leica. At some point, I began buying older models rather than the newer ones. I was a real collector very early. And if you collect lots of cameras, at some point you start dealing in them. And so my hobby became a business. Lars provides collectors all over the world with their dream cameras. Some of his cameras come from customers. Others he searches for worldwide, but price is not always the most important thing. Many Leica collectors have emotional reasons for their hobby. The collector looks for a camera with a history. 
that means a product from the 50s or earlier, the kind the great photographers of those times used. Ideally, it would be the very camera used by one of those photographers. Lars owns a camera with historical value, valued at over 100,000 euros. He keeps it in a safe. This is a prototype M3 camera. It's a version made just before the camera went into production. Only about 65 were made altogether, and only about 10, 12 or 15 of them have survived. Many Leica aficionados are fascinated by the flexible system. Even 70-year-old lenses can be easily screwed onto the latest models with the aid of an adapter. That's part of what turns many customers into collectors. Taking photos and collecting, Leica satisfies both desires. Customers who buy a Leica have a liking for photography. Anyone can put on a watch or wear an expensive belt or an expensive suit. But a customer who buys a Leica is someone who is photographed. Someone who may not have been able to afford a Leica when he was young. And so today he buys several. Leica made the first 35mm cameras, the most legendary ones. Maybe that's the fascination. Many world-famous photographers and artists have lost their hearts to the Leica, including movie director Wim Wenders. Leica photographers are people who are primarily interested in the picture. They're not technology freaks, but people who consider the picture as, let's say, sacred, and who found their way to the picture through a Leica. Leica allows people to approach picture-taking differently than they would with another camera. And then the big moment arrives. Hundreds of cameras gaze on in envy because this evening is devoted to just one of them. The S2, a medium-sized camera with an automatic focus that will continue the legend. This was really Leica's best-kept secret in a long, long time. And of course, I'm surprised and very impressed. Leica fans admire the new member of the family, but the new baby still has to show whether it can live up to the family name and contribute to the illustrious history of Leica. Ducks, mice and deer. These are just a few of the colorful creations that can be fashioned with paper star. This new construction toy and craft idea, made out of paper, is for the young and the young at heart. Paper Star is the brainchild of Bruno Winter, a young designer who lives in Kassel. The idea came to me when I was remembering that I'd once done origami as a child and gone a bit beyond the rules. I used scissors, glue and toothpicks. I made a little ship and I was really proud of it. I had the nice feeling of having designed something all by myself. Twenty years later, Vinto returned to his childhood pastime of working with paper while completing a degree in design. Paper Star was born. Its four star-shaped elements are made of brightly coloured, recycled paper. The star's points connect with one another and the paper's flexibility allows a myriad of shapes to be created. Paper Star is three activities in one. It's part handicraft, part origami, the 2,000 euro Japanese art of paper folding, and part construction toy. For me, paper is the number one material for design. It's also the one you encounter in your youngest years. When you're drawing and painting and doing crafts, it's very flexible and it reacts to any change. Bruno Winter was born to a Japanese mother and a German father. He grew up in the Bavarian city of Bayreuth and moved to Kassel to study design. In 2007 he graduated from the city's art academy. The 31-year-old designed this skateboard with extra-large wheels to go through wintry snow and slush. He's made lots of practical objects, like this cardboard stool, his first creation made from recycled paper. An unusual display for glasses, as well as this expandable waste paper basket. 
It's like trying to solve a riddle. You set yourself a challenge and you see how you keep working on it and create something, something new that's never been done before. Paperstar was awarded the International Forum Product Design Award 2008. The jury of experts lauded its unique way of sparking the imagination. Castle-based publisher Rotopold Press sells paper stars for around 22 euros a set. If the product proves popular with customers, Bruno Winter plans to recreate them in extra-large versions. One of my favorite ideas is to create large-scale models for the paper stars. You could make something for your garden or something to climb around in. Big ideas and small pieces of paper. Bruno Winter's starry universe knows no bounds. They're almost as diverse as the paintings inside, but people seldom pay much attention to picture frames. Thomas Knoll is a third generation picture frame dealer based in Basel. Major museums around the world turn to him when they need a new frame for a masterpiece. I think the main purpose of a frame is protection. The protection is physical, so the painting can be handled without being damaged. That's what the frame offers. It's a three-dimensional object, and the paintings are always moved while in the frame. As soon as the painting is taken out of the frame, it's naked and vulnerable. So the frame's main purpose is protection. At Thomas Knoll's studio, buyers can choose from 2,000 frames from six centuries. But which painting fits which frame? Frames from the 17th century alone differ according to the region of origin. This is a Spanish frame, which is characterized by the powerful carving and heavy use of gold. When it comes to gold, after the discovery of America, Spain was very rich. The Spaniards made some very extravagant things and their carvings were unbelievably powerful. This is a Spanish frame, which is very different from a French one. There's a totally different philosophy behind it. This is a Louis XIII frame. An incredible amount of labor has gone into every detail. The frame has an incredible richness. Here's something completely different. A 17th century ebony frame from Holland. It's also very clear that the frames show the origin of the paintings. That's why we try to find a Flemish frame for a Flemish painting. And it tells us its origin. Not every painting has the right frame. So Thomas Knoll and the museums often have to look for alternatives. The Basel Art Museum, for example. Time after time, he's surprised to see how a frame can change a painting. I'll hold it up and you tell me whether you like it. Here we see the real difference between a gold frame and a dark one, which emphasizes the quality of the colors. Here's red, and very sparse color, which is lost with a gold frame. I really enjoy seeing a painting after it's repackaged. In his studio, Thomas Knoll produces frames with unusual formats and restores antique models. At the moment, he's working on one from the 15th century. We have a frame from that era. 
This is also a frame from the 15th century, maybe 1480, and here, in regard to the technique, we can see that this type of gilding, the style of the black frame, allows us to get an idea of how we can transfer it to this copy as best we can. In modern art, the use of frames is more liberal. In fact, many artists reject them altogether. There are no strict rules. Nevertheless, a frame expert is still in demand. After all, even a Picasso can look better in a 17th century Italian frame.